You know, I was going to moderate the last panel, but now I'm not. You know, I think we really need some more star power. So I've decided to bring in Zach and Gavin from the Vanguard to finish up the moderation. And we're, are we good? Yeah, are we good? And now we're here with the Vanguard, who's going to moderate the last panel. Oh, so we're live now. What's up, guys? How's it going? What's up, everybody? Surprise, surprise. It's uh, me, Gavin, and Zach. And Zach, here. obviously, yeah. Coming to you live from Kansas City. Obviously, we're the co-hosts of the Vanguard. Um, obviously, we're on YouTube, Rockfin. Find us everywhere. You uh, probably consume your indie left media. But yeah, thanks so much to KRTD and to uh, Indie Left News slash Indie Left Media for putting this together. It's been an awesome summit. I've been watching kind of throughout the day and have really been engaged and impressed by the conversations going on. So we're just super honored to be moderating this panel. We have some good questions and some awesome guests. Yeah, super stoked. And just to echo the sentiment that uh, Gavin had. So did we uh, want to have our guests go ahead and uh, pop on? Yeah, let's do that now. Awesome.
What's going on, everybody? Are we live now? I think we're live. That's uh, live what I now. believe. What's up? Where's the, I'm yeah. Zach and that's Gavin from the Vanguard. We are the surprise moderators. Uh, I guess a good way to kick this off would be uh, to go let, ahead and let the panel kind of roundtable introduce yourselves and maybe give a quick introduction. Uh, obviously, each of you likely needs no introduction to the people tuning into this. But uh, for any new watchers, anybody that we're catching for the first time, if you could maybe give an introduction, shout out about your channel, where people can find you and what you guys are all about. Uh, so if we want to kick it off with Graham. Hello. Uh, I do a show called Get Your News On with Ron, and <laughs> I have a cat that I really like. <laughs> My show is The Political Vigilante. Uh, I'm on YouTube, or as I like to call it, CIA Tube, since they have uh, demonetized me and pulled videos. I just got a copyright strike for a video I did uh, a year ago. So why don't you go check me out at uh, rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood. And of course, you can go to GrahamElwood.com for all that. When uh, I typically talk about uh, how, how I think uh, centrist Democrats are really great. And I like incremental centrism a lot. And um, I think we don't need a third party. I mean, I think Wall Street, it should be given more power. And that's kind of the stuff I talk about on my show. And uh, I'm a huge fan of the military industrial complex. I think they're doing great work. Big Biden bro. Yeah, exactly. Big, I'm a Biden bro. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for joining us though, Graham. And we're going to be getting into Rockfin today, obviously, and other alternative um, ways to get our message out there as lefties or just in general, people with anti-establishment viewpoints. So super excited to chat. And thanks for being here, man. Uh, Fiorella, do you want to give a little bit of introduction to yourself and the Convo Couch? Yeah, I am Fiorella Isabel. I am co-host of the Convo Couch with Craig Jarjula, who was on the last panel. We talk about everything. We talk about imperialism, corruption in politics, uh, just a new deep dives into what's going on with the national security state, the bills that Congress tries to pass without you knowing, like the latest one where they gave money to the police. Um, and we are actually also on the ground. We do a lot of activism ourselves, and we have also been demonetized by YouTube. We are also under their radar. We are also on Rockfin because they don't suppress us. And we want to continue pushing people to new platforms because at any given moment, all of us will be gone and you will not be able to hear the um, non-mainstream media propaganda narratives that they're trying to hide. And believe me, they are trying to hide them. We cannot even talk about things like COVID or the vaccines or the Great Reset. We can't talk about these things because you, you get demonetized. Julian Assange. We can't even talk about him. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us. And we're excited for this conversation as well. Uh, Mr. Ron Placone, do you want to follow that up? Sure. Uh, my name is Ron Placone. I am a lover of cats, watcher of hockey, president of the Falling Down the Movie fan club. And you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash Ron Placone. And I'm at Ron Placone on Twitter and all socials. Hell yeah. Good to see you, Ron. Good what about you, you, Justin? Do you want to give a little bit of introduction? Sure. You're a little bit newer on the scene to uh, yeah. lefty independent media uh, than the rest of these veterans here, but uh, one of the brighter and more exciting voices to emerge in the last year or so. So okay. we'd love to hear about um, your voice and the takeover and what your plans are for the future. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, definitely the newest uh, out of this bunch. Um, and I appreciate everybody on this panel too for, for helping me, uh, helping to inform me. And, you know, that's what I'm kind of trying to do now. Is, is kind of pass that on. Um, my show is called The Takeover on YouTube. Uh, I need to get on Rockfin because like Fiorella said, I think that that is coming. <laughs> I think that's definitely coming in and we've seen that starting already. And, you know, obviously what happened with Graham's channel as well. I know, Jimmy, you've been demonetized countless times, Ron. So um, that's definitely something that, you know, I'm pretty passionate about. And, and uh, I think that's something that we need to, we need to start exploring uh, new avenues like that. So um definitely we'll be getting on that that shortly but uh yeah on my show i just try and you know have conversations um you know with people like richard wolf people like you know kashama swan you know people actually um who are making you know differences and, and change um on the ground right now um you know activists like you know whole washington um uh, i've talked uh with ash Kalra about cow care um just these things uh you know smaller local things as well, you know, I th that I think is important and you can, we can make, um, you know, large amounts of, of progress locally, uh, probably more so than, than trying to, than trying to get Medicare for all right now on a national level, you know, even though we should still fight for it, obviously, and, and push the politicians, but, you know, we kind of, 
we kind of see the the landscape for that. So uh, just trying to yeah, have those conversations and, and, and advance the the discourse and um, and yeah, so that's what we do over at the takeover. So um, if anyone wants to go uh, check that out and subscribe, uh, we'll be out, having people. a conversation yeah. on Wednesday with Kashama Sawan. Oh, fuck oh, yeah, dude. That'll be a great chat, obviously. Uh, we'll yeah, definitely be yeah. uh, tuning into that. Um, and then, obviously, the man himself, the great and powerful Jimmy Dore. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jimmy Dore. I'm a Gen X or YouTuber. And uh, I, I like to refer to myself as a conspiracy analyst. And uh, I've noticed all the great guests on Jux Justin Jackson's new show, The Takeover. You know who I haven't? <laughs> I've noticed that I, I haven't been able to get on that show. I don't know what's going on. I must have them blocked on my email or something. That's that's painful. But um, so uh, our show, it basically is geared towards getting me an MSNBC contract. <laughs> and uh, and then I'll start calling other people grifters. That's basically what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm wanted to do for all, this whole time. And uh Anyway, it's it's nice to be on YouTube while it lasts because it's going <laughs> and uh, I don't know what else we're going to do, but um, I've been looking, watching a lot of heist films, and I think that mm. uh, I have I have a plan and we should all talk later. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm excited to hear that from you, Jimmy. Uh, it sounds like Are you, you might have some good ideas. Are you saying we're all going to make a heist film? Because I'm in. <laughs> oh, you go. Rod, I don't. Yeah. I, again, Ocean's I Eleven want... style bread tube heist film. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to start off, listening. <laughs> to start off with a good question, though, I think that's really important to discuss. And obviously, you know, I think it's pretty much consensus at this point that these platforms, whether it's YouTube, which most of us are all on, but also, you know, Twitter, Facebook, the rest of these social media platforms, uh, it's kind of the consensus that they constitute the new public square uh, in the digital era. Um, but the speech, the speech rights of their users do not fall under the First Amendment and essentially are completely at the whim of the corporations, as we've all experienced. Um, so some are, what are some of the ways that uh, you think we can build a movement to nationalize potentially these key social media companies and speech platforms such as YouTube, or at very least push to regulate them in accordance with the First Amendment? Because, you know, we can have all these other different platforms, but if we don't get to the heart of the issue... Um, then I don't think that there really is a solution in sight. So I was just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that uh, and we can open it up to the panel if anyone wants to, you know, immediately jump in. Well, I mean, I'll just say that the fundamental problem obviously is the corporate takeover of our government, right? We don't have, I, I, I say on my show all the time, we, your democracy was stolen from you a long time ago. We, there's no way to vote against uh, uh, Goldman Sachs at every election. There's no way to vote against them. So uh, the big problem is the corporate takeover. We don't live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy. A big part of that, of course, is that they take over the media, right? So they oh, they have the media, the billionaire-owned media. There's a handful of billionaires that own all of the media. And that's the big problem, right? So whenever someone does a revolution, the first thing they do is they take over the radio and television stations, right? Well, now there's the internet, but they've got us on there too. Google and Facebook control the flow of information and we can't fight back against that because when we try to push back against their power of the narrative, they uh, block our channels, they take down our, uh, our posts, uh, they label us conspiracies. And so, uh, the bigger problem, I, I think all we can do is try to wake people, all I can do is try to wake people up to the corruption of the system and to let them, uh, no matter who you vote for, you're getting screwed. Joe Biden won't even do the things that he campaigned on. So I think what we have to, if, if there's any chance to save the United States from sliding into be like Brazil, we have to figure out a way to do direct action on a big scale. And, uh, you know, the problem is the labor in the United States is in bed with the establishment, right? And, and I mean, look how corrupted the teachers unions are. Look, I mean, it's just amazing. So um, it, yeah. when the teachers yeah. go on strike and they do something, they have to do it against their union leadership at most of the time. So um, uh, I, I think that the, the, all we can do, all I can do is raise consciousness and try to work together with other people to try to, uh, you know, uh, everybody talks about, uh, uh, you know, as associations like the DSA, right? And that I think what Force the Vote reveals that the DSA is a 
just another pretend organization that is sheep herding progressive energy into a pro-war corporate Wall Street party. And that has to end. You know, when we decided to do force the vote, we got 150,000 people at a town hall, which is 50,000 more people in the DSA as members. So people are ready for something, you know, and I, this isn't against the DSA membership. We're just talking about what we need to do is we need to wake people up, raise conscious. We have to do consciousness raising. We well, have to do direct action. Jimmy, and I'll stop there. Would you would you agree that um, a movement for a nationalization or at least a regular regulations of these social media companies like YouTube in order to force them to act in accordance with the First Amendment? Would you agree that the, that movement would be part of that broader movement you're talking about and, you know, part of that awakening? Because it's, well, if, step- it weren't for, if it weren't for shows like all of these, then, you know, I fear that, uh, you know, we, we won't have these these voices leading that charge. Well, what I'm trying, yes, I agree with what you said. I'm trying to get people to realize that right now, social media and YouTube is uh, akin to what the telephone was 50 years ago, right? So, uh, you, you know, if you couldn't cut off somebody's telephone because you didn't, you know, yeah, they, exactly. they couldn't cut off the Klan's telephone. They couldn't cut off the Black Panther's telephone. You know, right. so that, that, that's seen as a utility. So because you can't live in modern society without a telephone, yep. right? You couldn't live in modern society without uh, electricity. You can't live in modern society anymore without the access to social media to amplify mm-hmm. your message. That's how people communicate. That is the town hall. And so we have to, I'm trying to get people to realize that, that you can't cut. So to, to cut people off from YouTube or Twitter or Facebook is akin to cut Cutting them off from their telephone, yep. and we and I think that's that would be the move to to make them public utilities, and that's yeah. what they should be. I, I totally agree with that. And does anyone here have any ideas about the best way to build that call or build that movement to make that a reality? Well, I just well, wanted. To- go ahead, Fee. No, I just wanted to say, um, in order for that to happen, people need to realize that we live in uh, an increasingly authoritarian environment, and right now, uh, just the f- the the thought of speaking out against the state propaganda narrative deems you a conspiracy theorist and a lot of independent media doesn't really touch on those subjects and they don't really actually go deep enough in them to actually expose what's going on and of course I'm talking about the usual suspects but it's in that fight itself is to understand that if we don't have a free press and we don't have free speech and we don't because Julian Assange is still in Belmarsh prison awaiting extradition for exposing U.S. war crimes. And because of that, all of us are obviously the next to go. And it's not just us, it's everybody else. And when you realize that we live in authoritarian in an authoritarian state where we can't freely express ourselves or even question anything that's going on and we have a limited time, then the the fight needs to also be just extremely amped up as far as what we're discussing here. Because if if we can't if we can't question uh, things like COVID, if we can't talk about other solutions besides the vaccine, if we can't talk about things that we should be able to talk about. And if it's if that makes us conspiracy theorists, just to even mention right. something regarding the elections, and even if we don't agree with it, we are we are our own worst enemy. And of course, I'm nationalizing the, um, you know, these platforms, which have become the modern day public square is a way to do it. But they're not going to let us do that. They're not They're Like, there's no electoral way to do that. It's not like the squad is going to say, all right, let's vote on this. Let's bring this vote. So make sure all of your civil liberties are protected because they're protecting theirs. The squad just just pushed two billion dollars for protection for Capitol Police, for themselves, for security measures, while simultaneously taking away your rights. And if we if we don't point that out, right, if we don't go deep into the legislation of what does this mean in this state of authoritarianism, then we're doing ourselves our, a disservice. And I think we have to understand, like, we are the people that are going to lead this movement. I mean, all, all of us, we have a, a platform. We need to lead and, and speak out on this because people need to realize how critical the situation is so they do get out in the streets because we're not gonna vote we're not gonna vote our way out of this. We're not gonna bring in legislation to fix this. This is, has to come from the public demand. And unfortunately, one of the things that the left has failed at, because you can talk about Marx, you can talk about theory and Lenin all you want, but though there's one thing that leftist movements never dealt with, and that is this technocratic panopticon, that is this merging of big tech with our government, with these fascistic billionaires, that, that is something that nobody, nobody could have predicted. And you know, it, now with the phone, everybody is a, is, a, is a citizen journalist. And so while that gives us power, 
it also cuts off our, our medium of communication. So we also have to build outside networks, support outside new forms of media like Rockfin and whatever other platforms there are, whether it's Panquake or whatever else there is, simultaneously understanding that we need to prep for a time where we might not be able to rely on normal communication. So if you don't think it's reasonable to um, push for like the public regulation of these companies, then what would you suggest that energy be um, directed towards just as a movement of people concerned with censorship and free speech? I'm not saying I'm not saying you don't push for it. I'm saying you push for it while understanding they're not going to let you have that. And what do you mean by push for it? Push for it electorally, thinking that you're going to push a politician left. That's not going to happen. Whether you elect Nina Turner, whether you elect somebody else, the this, this system is set up this way. This is how the system is set up. They're not going to simply say, OK, you won. First of all, our elections are rigged. Our elections aren't fair at all. I, I've studied the elections for the last five years. We have we don't have fair elections in this country. And so for one. So if you think we can vote our way out of this, that's not the solution. The solution is to get people to understand we can't and to do local initiatives like because as as Justin pointed out, there's a lot locally going on that you can do that is more feasible and attainable than at a national level. And you, while you can push for these things, you have to not just push for a politician to do it because they're also PR managers to the whole the whole system. Like they're, they're, we don't like have, these people are, are PR narrative managers for the actual state agencies. They don't have as much power as we think they do. So what, it seems hopeless, right? It seems like I'm being a cynical asshole right now. But what I'm trying to tell you is that there is power in people understanding where we are so then we can move forward through direct action, through mutual aid, through getting out in the streets and demanding the freedom of press. We did a protest where only uh, you, know, you know, 70, 60 people showed up. It was great because it was for free speech. It was against censorship. But we need to see people show up in the thousands. And the way to do that is to actually un make people understand that if we don't have access to us, to free press, we lose access to our free thought. We lose access to question. We lose access to everything else. And so I think the first uh, thing to do is to actually understand where we're at, understand that we need to move forward through actually creating movements to build change. Change doesn't happen from the legislation out. Change happens from the people pushing the, the forces through. Change won't come from within the system. Totally agreed. Uh, how would you suggest that we, like I said, continue to build that public pressure and movement, Ron? Oh, yeah. So, and also, I think, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. What was going on? Oh, I, sorry. sorry I no, go somebody. ahead, Ron. Oh, no. I just looked like Graham had said something a little beforehand. I didn't want to pop over you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think that the first thing we need to do, like as far as like, okay, these, these social media companies becoming utilities, I think that starts at a grassroots level and it starts by making the inter internet itself a utility. And that's something that you can act on wherever you live via trying to push for municipal broadband. That's an issue I talk a lot about on my show. It's an issue that I've fought for in two different communities. So far, I'm 0 for 2, but, uh, but I'm not going to give up. You know, I'm still, I'm still fighting where I live now in San Pedro. And what that does is it takes the internet out of the hands of the big cable companies, because keep in mind, the big cable companies essentially have an organized duopoly. That's why we have shittier internet than most, like many other developed countries, and we pay more for it. Uh, you know, if you look around to a lot of different countries, it's they, they pay about the equivalent of twenty five, thirty dollars a month for their Internet and they get way better than what we get. Uh, and except for in some parts of the United States, why are they different? Because they already have municipal broadband. You can look at examples in Chattanooga, Tennessee and Sandy, Oregon, uh, mm -hmm. in Charlemont, Massachusetts. It is doable um, and it is already happening. So we're at a point now where. You know, there was a point in time where electricity, there, there was a digital quote div or, or a divide. It wasn't digital then, but a divide uh, with electricity. And we've gotten a lot better with it. There's actually still places in the United States that are underserved when it comes to electricity, which is hard to imagine. It does exist, but we've come way further uh, than where we were years ago 
Well, the same thing needs to happen with the internet now. And, and that, that starts at a, a grassroots level. Going forward from there, what I would like to see happen, and again, this is something that we the people need to come up with and fight for ourselves, is, uh, is an actual proper digital bill of rights. That includes how the social media companies have to behave. That includes net neutrality. That includes municipal broadband and access to the internet. Um, that's a tall glass of water. But again, politicians aren't just going to hand you, you know, a, a more democratic system. You, you have to fight for it tooth and nail it and go one community at a time if you have to. And, you know, there's even ways that we can do this via a people's legislature. Mike Ravel wrote a book laying out how that is possible. Um, so, so I, I think that's the best way forward. That's awesome. And shout out to the great Mike Gravel. Obviously he's done a lot of innovative work in that respect as far as the people's legislature. I love that idea too. Uh, do Justin or Graham, do you have anything to add to this conversation? Uh, I was just going to say like, um, you know, like I agree, like electoral politics, I mean, good luck. I mean, you can try to organize. That's great. I'm not saying no, but the kind of what fee was saying, uh, and then looking for specific actions like a digital bill of rights that Ram was talking about. I think we got to get more creative. I mean, in terms of like, look what Wall Street bets did. That was just an unbelievable, that was like one of the most powerful revolutionary acts I've ever seen. And they took $70 billion out of the hands of the oligarchs and they did it. Nobody got arrested. Nobody got shot with a rubber bullet, no tear gas, no nothing. And so that was a really creative way. But I also really want to touch on uh, Panquake because, and I'm, I don't get any money from them. I'm, this isn't, I I've just seen it. I've just seen a demo of it recently and it is going to change everything. That's why they, I just, there was just a smear piece with me where they misspelled my name and Susie Dawson. Uh, it's just some crazy person writing whatever. And, uh, it, it's amazing. It is, it is, it is blockchain is decentralized and it is, so, and it, the way they have it set up, because Susie Dawson has people like Bill Binney involved, who's the best cryptographer ever. He's an NSA whistleblower. And you've got, it's set up in such a way that like Google can't come in and buy up and then, and then push their tweets out. They can't do that. I mean, just as she showed me this demo, I was like, as a comedian, I'm going to be able to sell more tickets to my fans because right now, and Ron and, and Jimmy know this, you, you know, you, you put it, something on Twitter and it doesn't go to all your followers and you're just trying to sell tickets or watch my thing or whatever. And so I honestly think it's why the, the it, Panquake is going to be a revolution and, and in the same way, like I think Rockfin, which is blockchain and they pay us in, in cryptocurrency is the future. And, and Graham, if people aren't, 100% familiar with Panquake. Can you give everybody the elevator pitch? Sure. The elevator pitch for Panquake, basically it's it's a decentralized uh, blockchain open source Twitter or social media platform where they can't, uh, if you're familiar with the blockchain, it's like a ledger that we all agree on digitally. Mm. It's and, and so you can't, so, so basically if Panquake kicks somebody off of Panquake, because they, it would only be because they like broke the law. They put child pornography or something like that. And then you can go to the blockchain and see, oh, they kicked this person off for this reason. It's not just like, well, wait a minute. I tweet, I, I, I tweeted out and what happened? It's, I don't know if it's reaching my audience. My audience says, I never got a notification or I don't, I follow you on Twitter. I got unfollowed. It's all going to be on the blockchain. So it's completely open source. And it's also, it's subscription-based. People, oh, I don't want to pay $5 a month. Well, now you, for five bucks a month, you're going to be able to not uh, get influenced. Right now, if you, if like Facebook and YouTube, the advertisers came in and said, no, 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 no. Suppress the Jimmy Dore show, suppress Convo Couch, suppress Ron Placone, suppress Graham Elwood, suppress Justin Jackson, because we want to push Rachel Maddow's nonsense down everybody's mm -hmm. stupid throats or whatever. So it's a blockchain open source social media platform that is going to be revolutionary and people can go to panquake.com and donate to it. Susie has a team of people working on it. It's almost done. They just need a little more fu funding. They're using, you know, um, crowdsourcing it. So it'll be like, it'll be like Twitter for the people by the people. And they won't even, the creators of Panquake won't even have control. It'll be on the blockchain. There's no servers that the FBI can come and seize. Like they've, they've set it up brilliantly um, because they are whistleblowers who have been targeted by the intelligence community. 
and they know how they operate. And then when you have the, when I heard Bill Binney was involved, I'm like, oh, well, they got it then. I mean, this is it. This is like, uh, you've, you've got Phil Jackson <laughs> drawing up your <laughs> offense. It's like fantastic. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a thing that can, that can revolutionize because as we, as we, as we all know, okay, we can petition the squad and the progressive caucus and then and it's never gonna, it's never gonna do it. They're gonna, <laughs> right. they're gonna give the war machine more money. It ain't gonna happen. So yeah. that's why they well, should go to pancake.com. Uh, that's a, thank you so much for explaining that. I personally am super excited to see uh, the result when it rolls out. I think it's a great idea. And I'm, like I said, just super excited to see the potential. Um, Justin, do you, have any, do you have any ideas about like nationalization of these social media companies are pushing to regulate them as public utilities before we move on to our second topic? I mean, yeah. I mean, like we said, I think we can, of course, push for these things, right? You know, whether it's actually going to come to fruition in a time frame that's suitable for the gravity of the crises we're facing, that, you know, remains to be seen, obviously. Um, but it's, it's not looking great. So I think things like Panquake, what, what Graham said, um, like, uh, like Roxanne, just these, these platforms that, you know, give the power back to um, the people and, and away from, you know, these centralized forces. I think that's really important. And I think it's important for, for us as a left to, you know, like Graham said, get more creative because I think, you know, even things like uh, NFTs, which a lot of, you know, art like grassroots artists are actually being able to sell their own stuff, right? It's actually giving power back um, and away from the centralized force back to, you know, a group, a group of people who for so long have, um, you know, kind of been left out because there's a centralized force, even in art um, of, of museum uh, people, you know, elite museum people who say, okay, this is what this is worth. This is what that is worth. Right. So I think we need to start merging with some of these new creative online communities um, and kind of bringing them into that coalition um, because we don't know what the future is going to hold. And we don't know if there's going to have to be some type of, uh, you know, change in systems and, and we're going to have to come together as a collective and decide what we want the future to look like right so i think we need to uh start merging ourselves with with some other coalitions to really broaden the left and kind of bring other people who um you know may, maybe don't know as much about politics right now or, or have ever been involved yes. in politics but bring them in kind of using their own language um to connect with ours uh and, and build the coalition that way Absolutely. That's actually a great segue, Justin, into another question that I wanted to get your guys' reaction to. Um, and obviously, we were talking about Rockfin, Odyssey, um, Panquake, these other alternative platforms that are popping up, as I said, presenting themselves in opposition to the censorious and corporate nature of YouTube and these other social media platforms. Um, but they do remain on the fringes and mostly at this point are catering to an audience of mostly like-minded viewers that are already fairly plugged into these issues. And um, is it, do you think it's better that we try to build up these smaller fringe outlets um, or should we focus on penetrating the mainstream more, so to speak, by trying and working around the rules as they exist on bigger platforms uh, to amass broader support behind our ideas, uh, given the very you know, limited amount of time we have on certain of these, uh, on certain issues. I'm, I'm wondering what you guys have to say to that. You can do both. Yeah, I think why not, you know, why not use the, the, the larger platforms to attract those people um, and attract as many people as you can while also kind of readying yourself and your audience and us as a community for the potential for YouTube to really just continue to move further and further and further right, like we've seen, right? Um, so I think you can do both simultaneously. Yeah, I think the move that uh, simulcasting, while, uh, like I said, knock on, while we, while we can, simulcasting from what you're recording onto YouTube onto another streaming service like Rockfin, which you can do, shout out to Ron Flacone for showing the Vanguard how to do that. Um, you can uh, now, you know, kind of reach people who, oh, maybe I'm just searching an issue into the search bar in YouTube, like what is going on with X political issue. Um, but then they hear you talking and you're like, yo, if you're interested in this stuff, you can find more content on XYZ platform i think that's definitely uh the move uh jimmy did you have any thoughts on that um no in specific i was thinking a little bit too about the recent um obviously the movement for liberation of palestine how it seemingly has gained some more traction in recent weeks and i mean obviously that's because of the horrific you know things that are going on in the situation but but i do feel like part of it has been because it has garnered some more mainstream attention and this movement has been able to kind of penetrate that bubble a little bit. Uh, and I'm just wondering if anyone has suggestions 
for how, um, you know, our movements, whether it's, you know, the call to free Assange um, or to pub or publicly regulate these utilities, et cetera, how we can really, you know, get that attention, force the mainstream media to cover us a little bit too, so that we maybe do get through to some people that are still on a diet of total mainstream media, which, you know, despite us here being in our bubble is the vast majority of at least the American population right now. Yeah, I mean, I think there are different ways of doing that. Um, I, 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 you know, what, what I see in Gen Z is a lot of them are getting sucked into this kind of like Vosh uh, sort of like understanding of leftism, which is really bad. But TikTok, uh, it needs more of us. You know, we need to figure out how to also talk to younger people in a shorter, condensed way. The, you know, like one minute, two minute videos. I think those are very effective. I've seen, you know, Soapbox do those videos that are also very effective. I think there's room for that. But it's also pointing out, not just criticizing what the mainstream media does and making fun of them because we could do that all day. I mean, it's freaking, it's so easy to do. It's hilarious because they're, they're so easy. This is why we do what we do right because they suck but also like covering things they don't cover for instance there was this uh, colonial pipeline that only robert yeager was covering for the longest time mainstream media didn't touch it until now they're saying that the russians uh hacked this uh their 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 system so it's kind of like that like kind of like showing them that hey with very little money very little bandwidth very little everything we can have people who cover these stories far better and, and far deeper at a non-superficial level than they can. And I think if we just start doing that, you're pressuring them to cover it because if it gets enough attention, then they have to cover it. And that's what happened with Palestine. Palestine has been like ravaged by Israel for a long time. And so has Syria, right? And like, it, it barely got any attention, but now we're in an age where everybody has a phone, and, and younger people are sharing these videos on TikTok and on the internet and it's getting play. So now it's harder for them to hide this, which is why they're cracking down and censoring everybody. But that's precisely what we need to do is like continue talking about these issues nonstop to the point where they can't ignore it any longer. To the point where they, if they ignore it, then they look like the assholes and they have to cover it, which is why they had to cover everything that was happening in Palestine because the Palestinian people were, were doing a, uh, a lot of social media. They were putting it all over the internet. I had them message me say, hey, can you share this? Can you share this, please? We're getting shut out by you guys as mainstream media. And I'm like, sure. And then more and more of us started sharing it. And guess what? Like they had to address it. And now everybody knows that Israel is an apartheid state committing genocide on Palestinians, where before we couldn't even say that. You can even remotely even talk about it or indicate it because it was anti-Semitic. Right. And now we're talking about, hey, Palestinian people are also Semitic people. So that's that's how we, I think, move the needle. We, we cannot stop going after mainstream media, but also we do it better than they do. And we stay on YouTube. We stay on Facebook and Twitter. We don't leave. But simultaneously, we build in other areas. We multi-stream, for instance, on YouTube and Rockfin and other platforms. We're going to start doing on, on Odyssey if we can, and just to get the information out. And I know that people who have been taken off of YouTube pirate stream in from to their friends' channels just so people get access to the information. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what I do. That's why I do what I do to inform people. It's not for any other reason, really. Like I, I, I love what we do, but it's it's to inform people. It's to get people to open up their minds. And I can't tell you how amazing it is to have somebody message you and say, hey, I used to, you know, believe this. And I was mad at you when you were criticizing the squad like a year and a half ago. But now, like, you know, you're right. Like, and it's like, yes, thank you. And I've seen people say that about Jimmy. I've seen people say that about a lot of us. And it's one of the things that I think shows you that even if you get one person that is another person that's going to go there and inform somebody else about what they learned from you absolutely anybody else want to uh, jump in really quick before we uh wrap all right well we really uh, appreciate yeah yeah, I really yeah. appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to do this uh, stream. Obviously, Gavin and I enjoyed being the guest host for this uh, panel. Uh, it was super great speaking with everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just uh, thanks everybody yeah. for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. It was awesome moderating yeah, this. Yeah. And 
really good conversation, really necessary conversation. Like I said, uh, I'm really worried about the algorithm and the corporate news just pushing all the lefty channels into oblivion, even if they don't totally destroy us, just, you know, basically smushing us down. Uh, so obviously, everyone here is doing amazing work and anyone watching should definitely support. You got something to say, Jimmy? Yeah, can I just say one thing? You know, I hear a lot about, oh, people want to say, hey, stop. Stop with all the infighting, right? The infighting's <laughs> not helpful. <laughs> And, uh, you know, infighting is when people who share common goals disagree on a strategy to get there. Mm -hmm. And what I think we saw with Force to Vote is that a lot of people actually don't share our common goals. They pretend to share our common goals. And then when the moment comes to act on our common goals, they kneecap it and bullshit us and stand in our way. And because they're not. So I, I, that's not infighting. That It's very helpful to illuminate the people who are actually not, don't share our common values and get them out of the way because they're, for whatever reason, they're carrying water for politicians and the establishment. Um, and so we saw that with The Intercept, I mean, The Intercept now is just a garbage organization, just like the Young Turks and a lot of other people. So uh, I, that's not, I just, wanna, I just wanna make sure I get that message out because I see that in a lot of other shows, that'll be a topic. Hey, what the infighting, the infight, it's not infighting when you're uh, exposing that these other people don't actually share our goals. And to dismiss them, that's not that's not infighting. Okay, that's all yeah. I just wanted to make that. Well, point. we're a big yeah, fan that's... of infighting here at the Vanguard. So yeah, well, the thing is, is that we 100% echo that, that sentiment here. We have to be clear on what the fuck we want and how we're going to fucking get there. And there's no way to do that if we don't talk about what we're thinking and what be clear on what our strategy is. And if we don't call out the snakes in the fucking grass. So appreciate the work that everybody on this panel does, and uh, we look forward to connecting with you all on another time.